I've increased in the next two weeks. <laughs>all right everybody we're going to go ahead and get started uh today's kind of a special day because we're actually hosting our very first webinar so we have people all around the state tuning in today to hear sydney speak and to see what the tucson council the arizona autism coalition is up to so i want to again thank you for spending your saturday morning with me and with us um and we have a really cool uh we have a really great agenda today um first uh, i want to welcome any newcomers today um and then we're going to introduce Sydney Pettigrove, who's going to speak to us about prevalence and incidence of autism spectrum disorders here in Arizona. So uh, before we go into that, I just want to share our mission with everybody. And our mission is to improve the lives of individuals with autism spectrum disorder and their families in Arizona by sharing resources and affecting autism systems reform through statewide collaboration and advocacy. Today's event is really a great example of that. Um, we are sharing resources amongst the community and we're so blessed to have really great specialty advisors like Sydney coming to talk to us and educate us about the systems that our kids and the people we care about um, are involved in. So Jared uh, is gonna come up and introduce Sydney. Um, before that, I'd just like any newcomers to just introduce yourself really quickly. I see some new faces that are here. I know you, but I don't think everybody else does. Uh, do you want to? Sure. Uh, my name is Sheena Prater. I'm the CEO here in Tucson, and I'm the chair of the Health Equity Group. Right on. And what brings you here today? Um, you know, I just want to be a more active part of our autism community, more than I already am, which is a lot. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think being here is, is a, a really big part of that. We were, I'm really happy to see your face here today. So thanks for coming. Yeah, it's your first time in front of me. Sheena. Sheena. Yeah. Sheena's been here before. I don't think so. Right. You saw Maddie Saller at the BCBA conference. That's where I saw her. I haven't been able to attend, but the Saturday was. And then, well, thanks for being here. Yeah. I know we have uh, Jamie Johnson. Hi, 
Hi, um, I'm my name is Jamie Johnson. I work at Planned Parenthood Mental Health Services. I'm currently a clinical supervisor for our development and regulation team, and um, I'm currently in class with Jacob from the Yeah, and I haven't been able to make it on Thursdays due to my team Saturday. Yeah, it's tough to make it on those Thursdays. We know. Um, <laughs> But we, we do our best to make sure we get as many people here as possible. Uh, Adrian Weaver is here today. Can you introduce Hi. yourself? Yes, I'm um, Adrian Weaver. I am an ADA student with Sound Assistance, and I work with the ELA Child and Special Education Services. Mm -hmm. And why are you here today? Well, I want to be um, more involved with the community. Um, you know, we're operating in this coalition of parents, see how everybody fits in together. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, just want to remind everybody that one of the things that we're going to be doing today is uh, breaking out into our committees, which we've established, the Education Committee and the Community Resource Committee. The Education Committee is going to be working in concert with Tucson Unified School District to come up with trainings to help uh, inclusion practices, behavior strategies, and helping parents navigate the system. We're also going to be developing a digital service navigation tool, and that's what the Community Resource Committee is going to be charged with. So yeah, this is very exciting stuff and we're excited to be a part of that. We're also, of course, excited to present uh, Dr. Sydney Pettigrove today. And so Jared's gonna come up and introduce her and then we'll, uh, we'll move forward. All right. Uh, I'm Jared Perkins, a president of the coalition and I get the honor of finally presenting Dr. Pettigrew. Uh, we met, I. Uh, had been working with some professors at the U of A and had kind of mentioned we were looking to start the coalition. And I just said, who needs to be involved with this? And the name that kept coming up was yours. And mm -hmm. so uh, I asked if we could sit down. You generously gave me some time in your office, which was great. We had a great discussion. And since then, you've agreed to be um, a specialty advisor. And today we have kind of a, an honor to listen to you talk about your prevalency study. So. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Pettigrew is an epidemiologist at the U of A. Um, uh, she specializes in surveillance and epidemiology of birth defects and developmental disabilities and environmental epidemiology. Uh, and she's currently the epidemiologist for the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Surveillance Program and for the Arizona Muscular Dystrophy, Dystrophy Research and Surveillance Program. That's a mouthful. But uh, pretty much she's going to explain to us what that means today. So uh, we're really excited to have you, and um, yeah, welcome. Do we need to switch over here? To... Yeah, I'll go ahead yeah, and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the camera's kind of fo over yeah, here. Yeah, focused over here a little bit. Yeah, and if you need to change thing. slides, unfortunately you're going to have to press just... the button. Next time we'll have jump it. forward and um, and tap it. So, I'm Sydney Pettigrove, and I've been involved in looking at the um, prevalence of autism in Arizona, parts of Arizona, since um, 2001, actually. So uh, we've been doing this for quite a while, and um, um, so the most recently published number from our surveillance system is the one in 88 number that you're probably familiar with. And so what I'm gonna talk, talk about today is, where does that number come from anyway? And um, so that's what we're gonna go through. And then hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, we'll schedule me to come back and talk about the new numbers because they are coming. So. I'm, I'm very excited, but I can't talk about it today. It's embargoed. So a little bit of history about how this effort got started. Um, you may have heard of Brick Township, New Jersey. And of course, of course. Yes. So in Brick Township, New Jersey, people started noticing that it seemed like there were a lot of kids that had autism. And so um, people that were noticing this and becoming concerned about it um, contacted their health department. And there was a concern that, you know, um, this could be the result of uh, environmental issues. So uh, pollutants in their area. 
So they contacted their um, health department and they said, you know, we think there's really something going on here with autism because we're seeing a lot of it. Um, and this was back in the early 90s. And um, so eventually it worked its way up. It got reported to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And there are our national um, group that is charged with figuring these kinds of things out. And um, they, they actually do a really good job of it. And so the CDC um, uh, launched an investigation in Brick Township, New Jersey. And they used their methodology that they had developed for a system that they run in Metro Atlanta called the Metro Atlanta Developmental Disabilities Surveillance Program, which is known to its friends as MADSPA. And just briefly in MADSPA, they look at cerebral palsy, hearing impairment, mental retardation, or intellectual disability as we're calling it now, um, visual impairment, and they added autism for the 1996 study year. Um, and that was after their investigation in Brick Township. So they developed, yes? How do you spell MADSPA? MADSPA, M-A-D-D-S-P. So it's Metro Atlanta Developmental Disability Surveillance Program. And I, I do like to take questions as they come up in your minds, um, but I'm gonna try and also get through the entire presentation. So sometimes you'll anticipate me and then I'll put you off. That's coming in two slides. But um, go ahead and interrupt me because it's a lot easier to ask questions as they arise. So um, so they had developed this system. It's been in place, I have to look up the year, but it, they've been doing this for quite some time. And they look at these um, disabilities in children and it's very active. They go to clinics, they go to schools, and they... Um, do record review, and so they're tracking the prevalence of these conditions. And they had developed a surveillance system. So what they did was they took those um, techniques that they had established in MADSPA and used them as their methods for conducting an investigation in Brick Township, New Jersey. And this is a very active and labor-intensive way of looking for kids with problems that is not generally what is done. And, um, and so because they look harder, they find more. And what they found in Brick Township, New Jersey, was um, they looked at children ages 3 through 10, which is what they do for the other disabilities in their surveillance program. And what they found was Autistic disorder, as originally defined, which is the narrower definition, um, they found 36 cases in their population of nearly 9,000 children, which was a prevalence of 4 per thousand. And um, if you look at the spectrum, the autis uh, autism spectrum disorders, which is the more broadly uh, wide, wider encompassing definition, they found 60 cases, so that 36 is a subset of the 60, but they found 60 cases of the broader phenotype, and that translates to 6.7 per thousand. Now, this was a, a number that was much higher than anybody else had really reported on for autism. And um, that translates, by the way, to 1 in 150. So, um, and that, that was definitely the highest um, reported prevalence at that time. So, uh, it was prior to 96. So, because it was in 96 that they added autism to their list of disabilities that they were looking at for MATSPA. Um, so, one of the responses to this finding was adding autism to MADSPA. And the other was to create a, the um, Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, ADAM. And um, they provided funding um, and they, um, they put out a request for proposals 
and various different sites propose to uh, conduct surveillance in their area for autism spectrum disorders. And we've had states going in and out of the system. We've had anywhere from um, two to 16 sites in any given study year. Um, these are the, some of the sites that are, have been involved. Um, Arizona was one of the original six, um, the Mads Club plus five others that were funded in the first round of funding. And we've been consistently within the system ever since. So, um, so we've been at this for quite some time. So the goals of the uh, network first are to provide population-based estimates of the prevalence of autism spectrum disorders. And the importance of that population base is that if you are trying to count children who come into clinics, you're not going to be seeing all of them. You're going to be seeing a subset, and it's not going to be a representative sample of the population of kids that are affected. So these methods are designed to try and capture everybody that's affected within the whole population. So um, that's an important goal. Uh, another important goal is to use consistent methods for identification um, from uh, site to site and within a site over time. So we're trying to um, standardize our methodology so that if we see differences, then there, there's more of a chance that those differences are real differences in risk rather than differences in that just result from going about it in a different way. And as I said, um, our methods are a lot more active and um, labor intensive, and we look harder so we find more. So, um, so we wanna maintain that consistency uh, so that we're able to make valid comparisons. So we're looking for answers. Some of our questions are, <clears throat> is autism more common in some groups than others? Um, are rates changing over time? Uh, of course, that's, that's you know, one of the major things that everybody wants to know. We're looking at the whole population. So um, some of the sites define their populations in terms of uh, counties. Um, we, we originally, um, I wasn't involved in the original proposal, but my colleagues that um, wrote the original proposal said, we're going to do Maricopa and Pima counties. Okay. And then when the money came through and they really started looking at what was involved, we realized I had come into it by then. We realized, ah, no way, we, we can't do both. And there was a minimum population size that was specified in the request for proposals, and Pima County wasn't big enough. Oh, wow. So we, we sit at University of Arizona here in Tucson, and we collect data in Maricopa County. And that, that's how that ended up being that way. But, um, and we started <coughs> early on, we started um, with all of Maricopa County. And, you know, then the population of Maricopa County has grown faster than the funding for the project has grown. And so we've, we've nibbled off the outside parts of the county and, you know, we've had to pare it down to try and, you know, continue to have it be a manageable thing to do. Um, and we currently define it in terms of school district boundaries. And we have 15 school districts that we have been including consistently over time and that I optimistically refer to as the number of district, districts from here to infinity. That's our goal. That's our goal. That's what we're always trying for. Um, let's see. So, so these are some of, the, some of the issues we are thinking about. I try and keep that um, set of districts that we look at a set that um, where the population is as closely representative of the population of the county as a whole as possible. So, um, 
And when we look at differences over time, we look at consistent sets of districts. So, um, so that we're not seeing differences simply by having different districts included. So we're the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Surveillance Program. And um, so, you know, the goal of our study is to um, determine the prevalence of autism spectrum disorders among children aged eight in Maricopa County. And as I say now, it's a subset of Maricopa County. Um, and in fact, actually, as of the as of the 2010 study year, we have also added surveillance uh, for four-year-olds. And um, so, and that number will be coming eventually. And it, it will be very exciting because in the next round of funding, um, those four-year-olds are gonna be eight-year-olds, which opens up a whole variety of analyses that we can do looking at who we saw it for, who's still in at eight, all kinds of questions that we can address. Um, so the question is why eight-year-olds? Why, why were eight-year-olds originally chosen? Um, as I said, MASPA normally uh, does surveillance for children ages three through 10. Um, and they, when they added them in the, autism in 1996, they were looking three through 10. And they realized oh, autism is a whole different kind of thing. Um, because of the nature of how autism is diagnosed, the, um, the requirements for data collection are much greater than the other conditions that they had been um, including. And so they realized after the 1996 study year that for autism, best to just pick a single age and focus on that because you really can't do three through 10, it's just too much. Um, and they chose eight-year-olds. Uh, if you go younger, um, there's gonna be kids for whom they don't have records yet because nobody has yet said, you know, I think there's an issue with this child. They need an evaluation. So they're not yet in the system. By eight, most of the kids that are gonna get in the system are already there. They've got records. That's what we look at. So that's why eight-year-olds were chosen. So data sources that we're including, we're looking at all the special ed records for the districts that we include. Um, we look at clinical records, Phoenix Children's Hospital. Um, we used to include St. Joseph's Developmental Clinic when there was a developmental clinic at St. Joseph's, and it is gone. Um, almost all the services have now moved to Phoenix Children's. So. Um, we, when we added four-year-olds, we had um, uh, communication from Dr. Tim Jordan um, volunteering to um, have us come and review records at his shop. And um, we've done that. And uh, his population originally was quite young. And so um, he had approached us earlier when we were just looking at eight-year-olds, but he didn't really have eight-year-olds yet. So his his population has grown and we have added fours. And so we've added his shop. We also um, work with the Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center, SARC, and we've, we've done some review of their records as well. So, um, so a note about, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. So a note about the educational records. Um, in MANSPA, they found that um, analyzing their data, they looked at which children they saw only at school, which children they saw only at clinics, and which children they saw at both. And they found that those children that they saw only at schools um, constituted 44% of the cases that they found. So if they had not had access to school um, information, they would have missed 44% of their cases. And not too surprising, the characteristics of the children that they saw only at schools were not the same as the characteristics of the children that they saw in clinics. Um, and in fact, they were um, more likely to be from traditionally underserved populations. So lower SES, and they were more likely to belong to um, 
ethnic minorities. So no surprises there. Who has access to clinics? So this is part of the um, rationale for why we do things the way we do. If you really want to see the whole population, you really need to include the school. Um, because for many kids, that's the their sole source of diagnosis and um, interventions. It's all happening at the school. So in Arizona, we are actually the site that has the dubious distinction of having the greatest proportion of our cases that are school only. So in the 2000 study year, 81% of our cases we saw only at schools. Those kids did not appear at any of the clinics that we were including. Um, it's changed since then, um, but not a lot. We're, we're still running at 77, 78%. Um, uh, overall, um, probably New Jersey has the greatest proportion that are both and the lowest proportion, but I don't recall the numbers offhand. It's been a while since I looked at those. I'm sorry, I got confused. Where's the 44%? That was from Metro Atlanta. Oh, okay. So they would have missed 44% of their cases. Oh. That's probably more typical. So, and, and why is that? Um, you know, sometimes I get calls from people around the country who are, they have kids with autism, they're thinking of relocating to Arizona, and they're calling to ask me, you know, about what, what's available in the way of services. And I say, you probably don't want to move to Arizona. <laughs> you probably really want to move to New Jersey, actually, because that's where New, New Jersey is the place where the services are really um, the most comprehensive. Um, so, um, yeah, so I kind of trying to discourage people. We have, we have opportunities for improvement, let's just say. So, so how do we go about collecting the information? Well, we start with a request for records. Um, we use international classification of diseases codes in the clinic sources and we look at special ed records in the educational sources. We send our team of abstractors around to the study site and they, they look through the records. What they're looking for initially is what we call a trigger. And it's a description of a behavior that is consistent with a diagnosis of autism. And there are the, it, the list is pared down. That's 34 uh, triggers that we're currently using. If the record does not include a trigger, yeah, we're done. Uh, the record's put away, we mark it in our database, does not qualify, end of story. If there is a, uh, a trigger that's present, then they do um, record abstraction. And they actually type into our database word for word descriptions of the child's behavior as noted by a qualified examiner. So that would be a school psychologist, it would be a developmental pediatrician, um, actually, there's a variety of medical specialists that, that would be considered a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Um, and they collect a variety of information. That information is then sent through an expert review process. And um, the experts are all trained in a consistent way. And our case definition is based on the DSM-4. So, we started this in 2000, right? right. And, and actually, if you think about it, still, even in 2012, most of the eight years of the lives of those kids that are in our 2012 group, um, they were under the DSM-4. And so, we are continuing to use the DSM-4 for the 2010 numbers that are coming soon. And for the 2012 study year, which is the last study year on this round of funding. When we apply this summer for the next round of funding, um, that's when we'll tackle the issue of the DSM-5. I'm confident that our methods are going to involve, 
actually using both, at least for the 2014 year. Um, so that we'll be able to look at how that affects things. But currently, we're still under the DSM-4. And so they have a set way of determining, does a child meet our case definition based on the DSM-4? Does the child really not meet the case definition? And then, of course, we have some that are possible cases. These may be children where there's just insufficient information to decide one way or another. So, um, so that, that's how we do things. It's a very intensive process. It takes two years from the first day of request till publication of the prevalence information. And, and two years is actually an improvement over where we were when we started. Um, but I think that's about as quickly as it can be done in a way that's very thorough. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. We um, include all of the even numbered years um, for uh, as steady years. So, yes. Um, we look at all of them, and I'll show you a graph and a couple of slides that'll show you why that is. Um, there are some sites that found that they were not getting a whole lot of cases out of their speech and language impairment category, and um, they stopped looking at that category. In Arizona, we find cases in speech and language, so we have continued to abstract every exceptionality um, and not leave anything out. And speech and language, it's, it's a great big category. Um, you get a lot of kids for articulation problems, but those are really fast files. You know, it's pretty pretty easy to look at and say, no, no, this this is not a child with autism spectrum disorder. So, so it's quick. There's a lot of them, but each one doesn't take a lot of time. So we continue to look at all of them. And you'll see, I have a graph. You'll see why we need to continue to do that. So we collect various demographic information, educational information, medical, clinical, and the real heart of what we collect is this behavioral, that's the verbatim abstraction of behavioral observations. And that really is the core of how we're making our case determination. So um, we, we do collect personal identifiers. And the reason we do that is say we have clinic number one with four children, clinic number two with three children, and school with seven children, we've got um, then four plus three plus seven, 14 children, right? Well, and here's the answer to your question. Um, if we have personal identifiers, then we can see, in fact, that we've got kids that we're seeing in multiple places that are the same child. So we need to know that um, in order to get an accurate count. Um, so if we had no IDs, we'd say there were 14 cases. But with the IDs, then we're able to say, no, no, really, it's only nine. Um, and this, of course, brings us to the um, topic of data confidentiality and security, which is something that we take extraordinarily seriously. Um, we have a wide variety of mechanisms in place to guard the confidentiality of the data at all times. Um, and in fact, we go so far, um, we, we um, uh, connect our data to the census to pick up information that we're not able to get through educational and clinical records like socioeconomic variables. Um, and um, when we do that, you know, we're collecting, we're matching up with maybe five or six uh, census variables. And in fact, if you looked at the combination of census variables um, for an individual, then that would probably, in some cases, enable you to, to say, oh, well, in fact, that kid must come from this very census tract because that's the only one with that constellation. And then there might be as few as five children uh, of the age of eight in the study year in that census tract. And you, so then you could get within five children of identifying an individual. 
which is not acceptable. And so we go through, you know, this uh, elaborate procedure of random rounding. And so we kind of file the serial numbers off of the census data so that in fact, you could not even take that constellation of census data and use it to narrow it down to within five children. So we go to extraordinary lengths to ensure the confidentiality of the data. So some results. So that's, that's how we get the data that we get. And um, so this is Arizona prevalence information. So we found in 2000, we found 6.5 per thousand, pretty much the same in 2002, 6.2. 2004 is an odd study year. It was the last study year on the first cycle of funding, and it's a smaller area because we didn't have enough time to do uh, as wide an area. So it's a little different, but it went up with, to 9.8. Oh, 9.8 for 2004. Right, right. So it's a little iffy about its comparability to the previous and subsequent years. But we do see in 2006, we went up to 12.1. 2008, 15.6. And so you can see our prevalence in Arizona by 2008 is down to 1 in 64. Okay. And 2010, drum roll, um, stay tuned. These um, numbers will be coming out, hopefully, uh, March 28th in the CDC's publication, the Mor Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports. I will obviously be sending copies of this as soon as it's available um, to the coalition. So, yeah, yeah. And if we want, we can schedule a talk for after the numbers come out and, uh, and then we can focus on the new numbers. So hopefully nothing will go off the rails. We could always get derailed by, um, for example, uh, a big important outbreak could knock us off the publication for uh, March 28th and would maybe delay us a week. So um, that's tentative, but that's what we're planning for. That's what we're gearing up for. So some of our case characteristics overall for um, the system in 2008, we saw 4.6 times as many males as females. That's not a surprise to anybody. Um, if you look at the sites that have um, IQ testing on at least 70% of their cases. Um, we find 38% are in the normal range, 24% in the um, borderline range, and 38% um, in the intellectually disabled range. Now, when, um, when autism was originally described, um, that number for intellectually disabled was 70%. And that's because they were focusing on the most severely affected children. That's where the whole uh, uh, concept of this as a, as, a, uh, uh, as a disorder that is recognizable was first noticed in kids who were very severely affected. And it's been, you know, uh, it's, it's been something that we're recognizing occurs actually uh, across a broader spectrum. So here's this, uh, here's this um, special education um, graph that I promised you. You can see the biggest chunk of our cases are um, in the autism exceptionality. And of course, this is the, you know, 81% that are in special education. But you can see while we, the only two categories where we didn't have cases were hearing impairment and tra traumatic brain injury. But we found cases in each of the other, um, each of the other categories. I, let's see, other health impairment, moderate mental retardation. I can't remember the what this stands for. Uh, the emotion, emotional disorder. There you go. Uh, mild uh, mental retardation, uh, speech and language impairment, and. You know. oh, wait, did you say yeah, eighty-one percent of all the kids in special ed have autism? No. Yeah. 81% of our cases oh, you're, okay. are in special education. Okay. Actually, 81%, no more than 81%, because 81% of them we saw only in schools. Okay. So, um, yeah. 
And the, you can see that the biggest chunk is in the autism exceptionality. But we are finding cases, we are finding children that meet our case definition in almost every category. And that's why we continue to include every category. Let's see, Th this is an interesting pair of slides. All right, so this is from 2000, the, the 2003 <coughs> year. We found 21% of our cases in Arizona either had a previous diagnosis from a clinician or they were in the autism exceptionality, okay? We found 5% had some suspicion of a, an ASD noted in their file, and 74% of them did not mention the word autism at all. And these are kids that met our case definition. So all the, when you, when you put together, I mean, one thing we do, we put together all the information on that child from all the different places. When you put it all together, the, the child would have sufficient documentation of behaviors to meet the DSM-4 criteria. And yet no one had ever even mentioned the word autism was in the file. So that was in 2000. Yes? That include PDD and I? Yes. I haven't mentioned that either. No. Okay, it's gotten better. Go ahead. Um, by 2008, that no mention category had dropped to 48%. Still way too high. And what, okay, so the, there's another, another big point that's made here. Um, you know, you ask yourself the question, is it really necessary to go through all of this rigmarole to count the kids. I mean, why can't you just go and look at, you know, who's in special ed for autism, who has a um, clinical diagnosis, right? Can't you just count them that way? This is why you can't, because you're gonna miss all kinds of kids. All the signs are there, but it hasn't been put together. It also raises questions um, that I'm gonna address um, at the end about whether or not we're perhaps overcalling this. Yes. I want to understand this five year period. So this was what are you doing? Can you talk about what can you talk about what you do with these kids? Like with all these kids like obviously the red flags and say there's autism, but there's no mention of it like P D and L I or autism in the file. Like, what do you do? Okay. So there's a whole can of worms there. Which is which is um, the nature of our agreements with our data sources. And actually, it's, it's an integral part of our agreement with our data sources that we, we actually promise not to make any kind of contact with these people at all. So... You don't leave a voice message on the parents' phone. <laughs> 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 don't contact the school or the say, hey. We give them. We can give them overall numbers. We can say these. You know, these are the numbers of kids that we think that have autism in your school that you're missing. Sure. So, yeah. I mean, we, and 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 we do that. Um, we can do that, but um, but we cannot identify individuals. For, we we don't identify an individual to anybody. Not to CDC not to the data sources, not to anybody. And that, that's kind of how we're, we're, I mean, yeah, you'd think providing this feedback would be, but, but um, that's part of the whole confidentiality of the data is that we don't identify an individual child to anybody at all, ever. This might be outside of what you can answer, but do you have any idea of a place like New Jersey, uh, how, these kind of numbers relate. We have data on studies like this where they can identify what's the percentage of kids going completely unmentioned in their studies? What's the percentage of kids um, You know, I should have the New Jersey numbers for that, and I could look look at that, but I haven't. So I, I, I should look at that. But um, actually, you're, you're leading into my next slide, thank you very much, which is how does Arizona compare to the other sites in the system? So this is the 2000 study year. Um, I, 
I have included along the bottom all the sites that were ever included in the system, whether or not so it's consistent from slide to slide. But um, there's only spots for the sites that were actually involved. And you can see, here's New Jersey, way above everybody else. Endless discussions about New Jersey. <laughs> um, my current theory is that um, that their prevalence is higher because their their um, services are much more comprehensive, and they're just really good services. Um, we initially thought that perhaps people whose children were diagnosed with autism would move to New Jersey, but we find that that's not the case because one of the things that we do with our data is we match to birth certificates to fill in information that we can't get other other ways and so we look at and each site can only match to birth certificates <coughs> within their study area i can only match to arizona birth certificates because there's not you know sort of a national way of doing that and um and so we can look at the percent of our cases that were born within the state and um New Jersey's percent of cases that were born within the state is the highest. Which to me says, okay, it's not that people get a diagnosis for their child and then move to New Jersey, but maybe some of what happens is that people are living in New Jersey, their child is diagnosed, and whereas they might otherwise have moved somewhere else, they choose not to because you're you're only going to go downhill with your services if you're in New Jersey. You're not going to get anywhere better. So, so that they would they would preferentially stay where they are. So that's that's kind of the way I interpret that. So we see that overall, if you put all the cases together and all the populations together, we get six point seven per thousand is the overall, and Arizona is right there uh, in the middle. We tend to um, be flying very synchronously with Georgia. Um, and for the first several years, Georgia, Georgia has been consistently the largest population that's covered. And Arizona has been the second largest for the early years. Since we had to uh, nibble away um, at our study site, we're not, not necessarily as big, but um, but because our populations are bigger, our numbers really drag the prevalence overall to closer to where we are. So here's this 2002 study site. And oh, you can't see that line at all. Maybe I haven't hit it yet. Oh, well, I see. Okay, right. This is some of these sites have limited access to education records. That's another can of worms. But some of those newer sites came in and they weren't able to establish data sharing agreements with their education system. So those are the ones marked with a star. Um, uh, there's the overall number, 6.6. .6, so really 6.7, 6.6, pretty much the same. Um, and again, there's Arizona, um, you know, pretty much the middle of the pack. 2004, that's the funny study year where um, a lot of sites had reduced study areas. Um, and um, you can see that the prevalence then overall has gone up to 8.0 per thousand. And there was Arizona. Um, Arizona leading the pack in 2004. So um, in 2006, the overall prevalence was 9.0, again, increasing. Um, and Arizona is tied with Missouri for the 2006 study year for the highest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 2008 is my last of the prevalence slides. <clears throat> By 2008, the overall prevalence had gone up to 11.3. And again, Arizona is high. We're surpassed only by New Jersey and Utah. Utah was a very small study area. And so this mm, is, is a, uh, subject to a lot more random variation because it was a very small number of kids, a small number of population. 
Um, New Jersey is consistently high. New Jersey doesn't appear in every steady year. That's another whole can of worms. Um, so what can we do with this kind of information? And this is just a very brief sample. Um, one idea about why the prevalence might be increasing would be that it, it would be because we are uh, better at recognizing autism among higher functioning kids. And if that's the case, we would see what we're seeing here in Colorado, where this is the increase in prevalence from um, uh, increase in prevalence from 2006 to, to 2006, broken down by IQ groups. So this is the um, highest IQ. And in Colorado, what we see is they had the biggest increase in prevalence among their highest intellectually functioning children, moderate in the um, borderline area, and the smallest increase among their most um, severely intellectually disabled kids. So that's the pattern that we would expect to see if the hypothesis is true that the increase is really being driven by an increased ability to recognize <coughs> autism in higher functioning kids. And, you know, you just don't, in Arizona, that's not what we see. We see actually a bigger increase in our intellectually disabled kids than we do in our higher functioning kids. We see, you know, we see this big increase um, overall. Um, North Carolina, you know, they do see this big increase in their highest functioning kids, but um, you know they've got also a pretty big increase among their intellectually disabled kids. So overall, you know, we see actually that we've got we do have the biggest increase in the higher functioning kids, but we've got big increases in the um, intellectually disabled group and the lowest increase in the um, mid range, the borderline. So um, so that's one example of uh, using this information to evaluate ideas about what might be driving the change. Um, and there's lots and lots of publications that um, we've are come out uh, with from our system as a whole. So I have a couple of comments, just briefly, I'm almost done. Um, so we're, we're not examining children. We're only looking at their records. Well, there's obviously a really big potential downside to that, um, which is that we may not be getting it right. We may be saying, this child meets the case definition, but if you saw that child clinically, you might say, no, that child does not have autism. Likewise, we might have kids that we miss um, that a clinician who was able to interact with the child would be able to diagnose. The plus side of our methods, though, is that we're able to include the whole population. There's no practical way of doing clinical evaluations of all the kids across the population. Because, you know, um, evaluation for autism spectrum disorders is an extraordinarily intensive process. So um, there, there is an attempt to look at this. CDC um, did a validation sub-study. And um, so they compared um, our methods, our record-based methods to clinical assessments, and they found a specificity of 96%. What that means is that when their clinician said, no, this child does not have autism spectrum disorders, our system also said no 96% of the time. That's pretty good. That's your reliability, 96%. That, uh, that's our specificity. That's our ability to say the child does not have autism when, in fact, the clinician says they don't. Okay. okay? There's another side of it, which is our sensitivity. Sensitivity is when the clinician says, I have this child in front of me, I'm done doing an evaluation. Yes, this child is, has autism spectrum disorders. Among those kids where the clinician said yes, we're able to identify them as cases only 60% of the time. So I'm sorry to say, but you have to think of our numbers as low ball estimates, which is really scary. Wait, where did the second one come from? I got the 96 CDC. No, it's, that's the CDC study. So what's the second one? The one that 
uh, also CDC. So what they did was this, this is a study where they, they, um, they used our record-based method, <laughs> but then they also brought kids in for a clinical evaluation. And some of the kids, they said, yes, this child has um, autism. And among those where they, the clinician said, yes, the kid has autism, our record-based method was able to say, yes, they had autism only 60% of the time. When they brought the kid in and they said, no, this child does not have autism, our record-based system was able to correctly say, no, they don't have autism, 96% of the time. So we're much better we're much more accurate at the kids that we say don't have it than we are our ability to recognize the kids that do. So, um, so questions? Well, um, we actually have some questions that we might be able to take from the audience too. Oh, all right. Uh, this all is right. new technology. We're not really sure how that works, but if you all <laughs> go ahead and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them and I'll try to get some questions from our webinar guests. Um, that means that um, that we're we're missing cases. That that there are cases out there that our system is not sensitive enough to to find. Okay, so that's the question I had. CDC is in with Ohio, not the other locations that actually have it. Right. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And that wasn't one of the study years. They did an odd year so that it wouldn't interfere with the conduct of the study. So um, they did an odd year and they spent a ton of money and they brought, you know, they sampled kids and they, um, in fact, they, they did, um, you know, statistical estimations of how many kids they would need to bring in and it was just beyond what was feasible. They brought in as many kids as they could feasibly evaluate. And, and that's part of the issue with, with autism is that, you know, it is such a, an intensive process to do the actual diagnosis. So when you, so when you move the OIP implication of that, um, the fact that so many children could do this with the diagnosis? Um, well, as shockingly high as our numbers are, um, there are really more cases out there than even we are able to report on. So, you know, how much higher, I, it's not, we're not necessarily catching only 60%, but, but the number, if anything, is higher than what we're reporting. So that one in 81 or the one in 64 would actually be one in less than 64. Right. If, if our experience is the same as Georgia. So that's another thing. Um, we know that we know that some of the variation from one site to the next has to do with the regulations in those um, states about who gets services um, and they're different from state to state there's no consistency there's no consistency from state to state state in the process of you know of what's required in order to qualify for services um, when we talk about the states with the um, intellectual functioning we can only include the states where at least 70% of the kids have um, testing done because if it's not required to test them, then they're not necessarily tested. And if they're not required to test them, who gets tested? Well, it's the kids that you think have, have a problem. And so you're going to be finding more intellectual disability because you're only going to test the kids where you think that there's a problem. So. Uh, so there are still um, artifactual differences. There's just differences in the way things are done. So what you said in the fact that we're looking at the state. So if there's younger cases that aren't included in the report from specific age, maybe we need to look at the younger too. 
R right, right. Although, although, I mean, we focus on the eight-year-olds and, and we're comparing, right. So we're comparing the eight-year-olds from this year to the eight-year-olds from this year to the eight-year-olds. And so, so it's repeated, you know, eight-year-olds. And then it's very exciting when, you know, now in 2010, we also looked at four-year-olds. And then, um, let's see, uh, in 2014, those four-year-olds are going to be eight-year-olds. And so then we have all kinds of opportunities for analyses of uh, what happens to four-year-olds when they get to eight. And then we start to, to get a whole uh, additional dimension on it. So we have lots of, lots of analyses planned. I'm sorry, you were first. Well, I was just wondering, um, have we identified, <clears throat> anybody identified environmental factors that may have changed since this, uh, where we started identifying the new ones that children are adopting now? Well, parental age, for one thing. Um, we have analyses that fairly consistently show that older parents have greater risk of having children with autism spectrum disorders, and we know that um, the average age um, of parents has increased. So that's, I mean, that's one thing. Um, but if you mean, um, you probably are more likely to be thinking of, you know, chemicals in the environment. And um, some studies have shown associations with air pollution, for example. Um, uh, in another talk I've done, uh, I, you know, we've, we've done some work trying to, trying to partition out the change. How much of the change do we think we could explain by the increases in parental age? You know, cause that's going to account for some of it, not all of it. How much change, how much change in prevalence could we, you know, attribute to, um, to, Right, you know how much how much can we um, explain by things we already understand, and um, and then how much of, is left of the change that we that we don't know about, and I think that people want to that people want to you know say it's this one thing, and I, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't think it's going to turn out that way, for for one thing. I think that autism spectrum disorders are actually not a single thing. It, I think as we understand more, we're going to more and more, we're going to find, ah, there's this subset of kids that's distinct. There's this subset of kids that's distinct. And, and as we are able to look closer, we're going to more and more recognize that what we think of as autism spectrum disorders is a group of, you know, that's, that's kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different groups that got there through different mechanisms. So sort of like cancer, how different things cause cancer, they all present differently, they have different outcomes. Right. Same sort of thing. Exactly. Only in this case, we have a lot of different causes that present in a very similar way. And so then it's very confusing because if I'm, if I'm going to do a study and I want to look at, you know, exposure X in the environment, that may be very strongly associated with a small group of the kids that I'm recognizing as cases. But if, you know, but if I'm not able to recognize that, that small group as distinct and I'm just mixing them in with the rest, then X may not be associated at all with the other kids. And so then I don't see anything. And so you can see that even in the genetic studies. So one study will find, ah, we've got this gene on, you know, this chromosome and it's associated. And then the next study that comes along doesn't find that. So we've, we've you know, so, some of the genetics things have been reproduced, um, but, but we've, got, we've got a whole array of genes that are associated. And, and so any of them could be involved. It's so, it's very complex. Are there prevalence studies coming out of other countries as well? Yeah, 
Yeah, and actually, um, I know that um, one was a very intensive study out of South Korea that came out around the time our 2008 data came out that was around 2%. 2%. 2%, so 20 per thousand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you can see New Jersey kind of um, coming into that range. So, you know, um, Arizona in 2008, we were at 15.7, so we were at like around 1.6%. So not so far off. So um, as more and more people ha around the globe have done more intensive kinds of studies where they're looking more closely, that's kind of the numbers. And every time we calculate our prevalence, we say, you know, we go into it saying, surely at this point it's going to level off. Gonna level off. We're looking for it to level off because... <laughs> How can it keep? How can it keep going up? You know, you have to ask yourself. It's like, well, they're really going to keep increasing until it's what? You know, fifty percent? No, you know. But babies are, are living. You know. Well, and and it's associated with prematurity, <laughs> so um, um, that uh, is associated with greater risk. So, and yeah, even um, even. It's possible you look at um, supplementation with folic acid, which um, decreases the prevalence of neural tube defects, um, which in their most extreme are fatal. Um, and you have to ask yourself, well, maybe our, our supplementation with folic acid, are we, are we preventing those fatal neural tube defects? But maybe, maybe those kids that would have had the neural tube defects, maybe instead of dying of a neural tube defect, maybe they're developing autism later. They're surviving that, but you know what I mean? So you can fix spina bifida or autism. Would the parents choose it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. No, but nobody really knows yeah. at this point. So, but a lot of people are doing a lot of good work trying to figure these things out. I'm sorry, I came a little bit late. Forgive me for that, but I have a question. Um, when you're, look, you're looking at overall information where are these numbers um, being based? Is this a study based? Is this statewide or is it centralized for everyone? Um, it's we're including at this point fifteen school districts in Maricopa County. Okay. So and I chose those districts based on a couple things. One is that they're districts that were willing to work with us, um, and another is that I tried to um, look at the populations um, encompassed by the district boundaries and keep it so that it would be representational of the demographics of the county as a whole. That was my goal. I'm not entirely successful, so. Um, and my other question with that was, um, we, we have generally been wondering, when a child is diagnosed, let's say they reside in Santa Cruz County, and their diagnosis is actually completed in Pima County, how does that number actually get reported out to the CDC? Does it become a Pima County number? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, so um, autism is not a reportable condition in the state of Arizona. It is in West Virginia and Colorado. And that's something that we could look into pushing for. Um, that might, you know, that might be a useful thing to think about doing. Um, what are the benefits of that? I'm sorry. Um, it makes the surveillance process a little easier. In Colorado, for example, it is a reportable condition and um, the people that they're required to report, re, report to are, in fact, the people who are doing the surveillance. Um, so it, it, it makes the data sharing agreements a little easier. We've had, we've had really good relationships with our data sources so far, so um, that hasn't been a problem. But um, um, so, yeah, it's, it's, only, it's only the subset of Maricopa County that we're looking at. And my last Right. Oh, it, it's the revised. Yeah, DSM-4 revised is what we're using.
So, and we'll continue to use until the 2014 study. year. But if you think about it, I mean, you know, those kids are coming up sort of most of their lives in, in the sort of DSM-4 mm -hmm. mindset. So in 2014, you mean like stopping in 2014, we're going to be doing a, a, a massive, crazy effort, um, and we'll review under both regimes. So uh, that's my expectation. That's that's. Um, we'll see what the formal request for proposals specifies. CDC decides that, but that's pretty much what we're all thinking is that that's what we need to do because you have to know, you know, we're going along this way. You have to know how does that line up. You know, and so the only way to do that is to review twice. Wow. So it's a huge amount of work. The hours, um, and I have some slides with the number of records that we have reviewed, and it is staggering, tens of thousands. Wow. And I, I have to say, I couldn't do it without the most fabulous crew up in um, Maricopa County. Um, the people that work for the project have been just amazing. Um, and they just do this day in and day out, you know. Um, and uh, my project coordinator up in, up in Phoenix, we've had just two project coordinators over the course of the, uh, of the uh, 13 years we've been doing this. And um, mostly uh, that's been one. The first one was just wonderful. She set up all kinds of systems that for implementing the methodology, making it work. And then she went on to uh, greater things. And um, we had our one of our abstractors step up into the uh, position and she's just incredible. So um, it's really been amazing. So. Not really. I mean, um, and that's that's something as a system that we struggle to try and convey. The um, sites that were selected were selected based on their perceived capacity to successfully carry out the methods. This sample is in no way designed to be representative of the population of the United States as a whole, or even and, and like I say, I try to keep it sort of representative of Maricopa, but Maricopa is not representative of the state either. And my subset is not perfectly representative even of Maricopa County. And so this is, this is one of these messages that we just feel like we're talking to ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 people, people take that overall number and they wanna say this is what it is overall. We're not saying that. <laughs> right. Well, at, mm, because because when I put the graph, I can't I can't include all the details. It doesn't. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit on the you know slide to say fifteen counties and, or fifteen districts and you know. So we just put Arizona. And, and that's, you know, that is something to remember that, you know, how representative of this. And we see differences. If I come back and talk about the, the new numbers, one of the things we'll talk about is the change in the prevalence of the Hispanic community in Maricopa County over time. Because in 2000, um, we had four times as, about four times as many um, white non-Hispanic cases as we did Hispanic cases. And that ratio keeps falling. So we still have a significantly lower prevalence in the Hispanic population than in the white population, but the difference is decreasing. Well, I was going to ask about it. I'm sure there's something that has to do with socioeconomic classes who are able to even present at wherever data is being collected, right? So 
whether their school has even the capability of collecting data or if, you know, none of them are really going to clinics as we saw, right? So, right. so based on schools and are those schools, do the schools have the ability to collect the kind of data that would even put a red flag up? And so even their ability to be recognized. Right, right. Actually, we're, we're hooking up with a um, person, a researcher that does text analysis. We have all this text that we've typed in, you know, and it's, if you've ever done any kind of data analysis, text data is just um, hard to, hard to deal with, but this is what she does. And so we are um, working on getting together a proposal to get funding to do a very um, intensive text-based analysis. And I don't know the techniques myself, that's, that's her ballywick. But um, we're gonna try and look at the text that we've collected over the study years and see whether there is an increase in the informational content of the text over time. Is there you know, an increased um, mention of characteristics of autism spectrum disorders over time? I, I'm interested to see whether, um, you know, do we have an increase over time in the frequency with which the person is saying, okay, I've looked for um, this characteristic of autism um, and I didn't see it. Because I think it's one thing to recognize it when the child is exhibiting it. It's another thing to be looking for it and say, okay, I don't see um, echolalia. I, I don't see, you know, I'm looking for this inability to make eye contact and I'm not seeing that. So that's not a problem. So I wanna know, is, there, is that changing over time? Because my sense is that some amount of the change has to do with increased recognition and better record keeping. And, but how to measure that, that's very challenging. So, um, so I'm, I'm excited about the possibility that she's gonna be able to apply these text analysis techniques and we're going to be able to st start to get a handle on that um, because you know it may be that over time we're getting better at recognizing and that's what I think is going on with Hispanic kids I don't think that there's been a big outbreak so to speak of, of autism in the Hispanic community I think that I think that people are starting to say oh, okay all right this is you know this is a thing I should be looking for this I should be thinking about it and I think there's increased recognition. Well, Cindy, I know you have class in 45 minutes. Oh. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming out. Okay. And oh, definitely, we'd you. love to have you again. Yes. Thank you very much. Now you have the, thank you, thank you. Now you have the background so that when the new numbers come out, you'll have what you need to know so that we can really discuss the new numbers. So I'm excited. Any chance you could send the PowerPoint back? Yeah. Well, you know, the great thing is that uh, we've been recording this. Right. Um, and so um, we can, we're going to upload on Vimeo with your permission. Yes. And uh, just so that people can refer back to this and we can let the network in Arizona know about uh, what, what you're doing. I might need to use it for one of my classes. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> definitely <laughs> make sure you have class. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be efficient. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay. Were there any questions on um, I didn't see any questions. I'm going to check one more time just to, I really do want to be able to. Uh... It's hard to, um, it's hard to include the people at the distance. Yeah, it is. And, you know, this is our first go around here. Um, yes, yeah, I'm using some new technology for my online class, so. Yeah, no, we didn't have any questions. Okay. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Well, thanks everybody for joining us who's on, uh, who's joining us through the web today. Um, we'll continue to include you in the future. And thank you. Thanks again, Sid. Yeah, I'm going to use the restroom myself. Good questions, Ratina.
I don't know how to how to end it. Yeah, or like how to make sure that they're recorded. Oh, um, Do you? 